So what happens when God pursuing men get honest about what's going on inside of them? So many men through the centuries have lived in shame and secrecy when they had feelings inside that didn't match the toxic masculinity of a church that sometimes worships John Wayne more than it worships Jesus. I believe in this next season, we're going to see a lot of men wrestling with some honesty that maybe they don't totally match the cisgendered heads of household ideal that was foisted on them by evangelicalism in their young upbringing. My guests today are Beecher and April Renning, and they've walked through this journey of guilt and shame and attempting to cast out demons and then realizing that their marriage is a non-binary one. They believe in a non-binary marriage they're not disqualified from God's love nor in pursuing the teachings of Jesus. And they're going to challenge your thoughts on those norms, perhaps. They do, however, believe being in a non-binary marriage disqualifies them from condemning others who might not fit the prescribed norm imposed by the American church today. How do you feel about non-binary people? Do you even know what non-binary means, stick around with us to find out on today's podcast. Also, if you like what I do on the podcast and all the free content I pre present each week, would you please do me a favor and go to my website, pastor-paul.com. Don't forget that dash, pastor-paul.com. Sign up for our e-newsletter and our community chat board where you can talk to others on the journey like you, ask me questions, and so much more. And if you're willing and able, would you click on that Support Pastor Paul button and provide financial help to get our message that God is not mad at the world spread even farther. Now to our podcast. Stick around to the end to hear how you can get some bonus time with our guest today, the host of the Non-Binary Marriage Podcast. Beecher and April Renning, right here with Pastor Paul, the Post Evangelical Pastor, on the Post Evangelical Podcast. <laughs> April and Beecher Renning. And you may know April LaJoy from TikTok fame, and also she is my partner in crime, along with that pastor from Oklahoma, Jeremy, on our evangelicalish, evangelicalish podcast, <laughs> as we argue about the true name of it. But April and Beecher, I'm glad to talk to you guys today. Hello. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great to be here. Good to see you guys. And so we want to talk today, and, and, and people know a lot about our lives through all our discussions in April talking about her uh, her partner. And so some people may be seeing Beecher for the first time here, but you guys are doing something really interesting in the midst of all of us walking through our beliefs and deconstruction and all this stuff. You've come out with a new podcast with a very interesting title, that may rock the world for some people in this evangelical Christian world. So tell us uh, the name of the podcast and where did the name come from? Uh, so we have a podcast called The Non-Binary Marriage. And that is because I am non-binary. And so April and I got married very much in the evangelical culture um, very much uh, kind of celebrated church kids, so to speak. And over the past eight years of our marriage, we have uh, traveled the long journey to um, yeah. being authentic. And so this podcast kind of is about uh, that journey and how we went from one place to the other inside of a marriage and maintaining a committed relationship. And, and our uh, faith. And our faith. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's that's in general, what the podcast is about. And I'm excited to be here and, and yeah. excited well, to be Well, let's start with that. Before. What does non-binary mean for those of us who are learning all of these, uh, these different words? What is non-binary? Yeah. So basically non-binary is um, under the trans umbrella. So transgender um, means um, someone who does not identify with the gender that is on their birth certificate um, and non-binary is under that. And it means that basically um, the person doesn't feel 
has never felt comfortable and doesn't feel comfortable um, classifying as male or female. And so they're kind of, it's kind of a, you know, I'm not playing the system, so to speak, um, that I'm just me. And uh, yeah, and so p some people that are non-binary use any pronouns. I use they, them. Those are my pronouns, but um, Just yeah. like non-conforming to societal gender roles, like gender non-conforming. Yeah, I mean, gender non-conforming is a larger, uh, also a name that, word get, that gets thrown around a lot. Um, but in general, and this is the distinction that a lot of that took me a while to figure out to understand and I'm still figuring it out, but non-binary is about how a person identifies, not about how they present. So oftentimes non-binary people might present more androgynous or might present more um, gender neutral or even the, um, you know, one or the other, mm -hmm. but it is there. Uh, my presentation does not dictate um, my identity. I am non-binary, whether I'm wearing, you know, masculine clothes or a dress like that. It just, I beat my name Beecher. I'm non-binary. And um, that's how I've always felt. And that's, that's uh, how I identify. Well, both of you are super creative people. And uh, so I want to show one of the videos you guys made uh, ab about this podcast. And it'll just give people a little bit more background into what we're doing. And also just show always uh, how well you guys present in your creativity. So let me share this real quick. Since my partner came out as non-binary, there's been an influx of pastors and Theo bros on my page to tell us how wrong we are. I'm just going to use this guy as an example. April, neither you nor your husband, its partner, are interested in living for God and by his commands. Which I said, you don't know me, but if you really want to learn more about our story and where God fits in all of this, you can check out our podcast, The Non-Binary Marriage. Shameless plug. Figured it was worth a shot, but wasn't expecting this response. I've literally watched your TikToks for over a year. You can't suddenly use the you don't know me argument. Um, I don't live in this screen, but this is a perfect example of what evangelicals do when they are met with something that directly goes against their faith. Like it drives them crazy that Beecher and I still call ourselves Christians because in their mind, LGBTQ and Christianity cannot go hand in hand. But they can, they do, and they should. Still waiting to hear what sin we've committed, and happiness isn't a sin. Since my partner came out as non-binary, <laughs> so you still identify as Christian? Yes. Yeah. Say more I, about that. That it, it, how do they go together? I guess. <laughs> what was the second part? How 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 do non-binary and Christian go together? for you guys? Well, I think for us, it's just kind of stripping this idea of, you know, the woman or the wife does this, the male or the husband does this. And we're just trying, like, we're just people at the end of the day. And like Beecher obviously was harmed a lot growing up feeling not like knowing that they were non-binary or something was going on and dealing with gender dysphoria, but having no outlet for it and, and constantly being forced into these male boxes of like, Oh, boys like this and boys like that. And then for me being a female, especially growing up in the church, I was always forced into this more submissive role that, you know, my, I am built or I am made to one day have a husband to then serve that husband and submit to that husband. And I can't be a leader in the church and all these different things that were taught to me as a woman and, and like taught to me what male and female roles are supposed to be and how, how harmful it can be when you inside don't feel like you fit those boxes. And then you think that there's something wrong with you or, there's just like constant inner struggle. I mean, I gave my life to Jesus in sixth grade because I was confused and didn't know who I was and didn't know if I should be a girl or a boy and was dealing with a lot of gender dysphoria, which is the term we now know, know it as. Um, and, and what age was that? You said sixth because... grade. Yeah, I was in sixth, sixth grade. grade. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I basically in fifth grade realized, okay, there's something off. Uh, or that's what I thought at the time. At the time, I thought there was something wrong with me about fifth grade. And so in sixth grade, it was like, oh, Jesus can take it all and take all of this shame and pain. And just and so I gave it all to Jesus and um, just stayed pure and didn't uh, didn't uh, it just stayed pure and, and didn't really engage with my sexuality or gender 
for a long time, um, hiding behind the kind of purity Christian blanket. But for me, like in the process of me coming out and realizing in the last, you know, three years who I am and that I'm not binary, you know, it's, it absolutely rocked what I knew as my faith because the foundation of my faith was running to God to fix this. And now that I'm like, wait, I don't need fixing. And so then there was this moment for me in my life. I'm like, okay, well then do I need faith? Like if this is the reason I have faith and now I don't, don't have the same need, do I still need it? And ultimately what I have come to in my life is that I still find peace in prayer. I still um, in, enjoy engaging with many of the stories of the Bible, not mainly Jesus's yeah. stories. Um, I, there are things that I learned because as I was hiding behind this purity culture and so died, um, dove in, uh, you know, I'd been surrounded in this faith culture. Um, you know, I definitely deconstructed for a long time and there's still things I'm deconstructing, but I'm also kind of reconstructing and going, yeah, no, I definitely, I personally see value in my faith. I, I still want to find a church, um, that, that I could go to and, and be accepted and, and celebrated. Um, and so, you know, April and I, uh, you know, I, I'm speaking for myself. Um, I think we're generally on the same page, but we have plenty of discussions about this. Um, and for me being non-binary, I don't see any theological issue with it at all. I mean, I'm fully affirming, but especially non-binary because um, I just released a TikTok the other day because as I've come out to people, pastors have kind of been like, oh, what's your theology on this? With like looks of fear in their eye. Because of course, as they have that discussion, they're thinking of the bills they have to pay and how, you know, their culture would reject them if they if they agreed with this theology. Anyways, I still tell them the theology. And mine is basically there's two parts in the Bible, two places in the Bible that people use to say that I don't exist. And it is going to be the creation story in Genesis where God created uh, a number of things, but including male and female. And uh, then in Matthew 19, Jesus is quoting the creation story, which incidentally, the chapter of Matthew 19 is about divorce, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, it says God created male and female, quoting Genesis, right? And if you go back to the creation story, so it all goes back to the creation story. If you go back there, um, God created land and water, yet there's marshland and, and swamp that you would be an idiot to walk around trying to classify. Well, right here on this, on this route is, is land. And then right here is water and it's a horrible yeah. life. And then the other thing of course is God created light and dark and then there's dusk, there's dawn. And so like for me, my life has gotten my life and my faith has gotten so much more beautiful when I've accepted the in between, which is myself but also so many other things. And I'm like, whoa, God, you are so much bigger than these two categories that we put everything in. And it's in nature, it's in, it's in animals, it's in the creation. So of course it's going to be with gender and it's going to be with humans. Um, so for me, my faith feels richer, deeper, more peaceful. Mm -hmm. And it's still something that I claim, although um, it definitely looks different than it did, you know, even five years ago. You're muted, Paul. Sorry, dog was barking. In that <laughs> light and darkness, we would say dawn and dusk is beautiful. And, mm -hmm. and so why can't we say the same about humans? I want to step back in the story a little bit. April, you meet this guy. He's wonderful. He's going to fulfill that dream of being a good Christian household and family, the traditional family, all of those things. And then... How did you find out maybe traditional wasn't exactly what it was going to be? Well, it was only a month into us dating that. And let me put quotes on traditional. Let me traditional. Right, quote unquote traditional. Um, so it was just a month into us dating. Beecher told me, of course, I told them every, you know, quote unquote bad thing that I had ever done. Um, it was like a confession. Anyway. And so Beecher didn't really have anything to confess because they never, they were squeaky clean, good quote unquote Christian boy. Um, but a month into us dating, Beecher told me that when he was in sixth grade, he tried on his sister's clothes and really liked it. And that that pretty much scared him and freaked him out ever since then. And, and of course, Beecher's telling me this bawling their eyes out. And, and in the moment I just felt, a lot of grace and compassion because 
it honestly just didn't seem like that big of a deal to me. And I, I had no idea what gender dysphoria was. And I asked Beecher, you know, like, well, did you do any, have you done anything since? And Beecher's like, no, no, I, I haven't done anything since I, I haven't even touched like female clothes, like completely shut that down. So in my head, I was like, okay, who cares? <laughs> you know, like it was just wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but then as we, you know, continued to date and, you know, started falling in love, it kind of reared its head in a weird, um, like mm-hmm. Beecher got kind of hyper focused on my past. And I had had sex before marriage with a guy that I had dated for two years. And so I had a lot of shame around that. Um, and so Beecher somehow was taking like their own shame with the gender dysphoria. And again, we didn't know that was what it was and was kind of taking it out on me in my past. And and I, and we even kind of knew, like we had talked about knowing like, this is just because you're dealing with your own shame around this. So I was kind of able to separate it. Um, but still in my head, I just thought, I thought, I knew that I loved Beecher. Whenever I prayed about it, I felt peace about like staying with them. And I honestly just thought whatever quote unquote demon Beecher was dealing with, because I did think it was a demon. We both thought it was some kind of demonic force. Um, that it would just go away because God brought us together and you know, it's, it's just, it's just going to go away because, because it's, it's, and honestly, like, even if in the moment, if you asked me like, well, what is wrong about this? I honestly couldn't really tell you it was, it just went against what I was taught. It went against, you know, the quote unquote norm, like not even just in the church, but just like gender roles in society because society is patriarchal as well and starting to change but yeah so it was um (laughs) it's a lot it's a it's it's a long story and it sounds like then beecher at some point then you started feeling like uh, this needs to be expressed in yeah. clothing and we, we see you wearing some eye makeup today and looking yeah. looking very well and good in your lighting there and everything. And yeah. and what what was that like inside of your marriage to start to say, hey, I think I may need to express this in some ways? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, <laughs> the whole I think this I might need to express it in some way was not um, I was not that cognitive. <laughs> it was more like I'm now married living in this small apartment. April is working a full-time job. I'm finishing up my graduate degree. So I'm at class some, but I'm also home a lot. And April and I, fun fact, are the same height and the same waist size. So I suddenly, since I've not, I've not tried on any, any women's clothes since fifth grade. And now it's like, there's a demon in the closet and it's calling to me like, and it's all, all clothes that fit me. Yes. All hours of the day it felt like. And so, you know, it was this season of like, okay, Hey friend. And I call up a friend, like I'm really struggling today. Can we grab coffee? So I just get me out of the house or I tell April like, Oh, I got into your dresses today. And she's like, it's okay. I forgive you. And then I would repent and ask for forgiveness and of course cry and all that stuff. And it, so it wasn't, um, it was never, it was never as, uh, you know, as clear of a thought as, Hey, April, I think there's something that I need to express more like the, there's something in the closet calling to me and I continually keep falling into that trap. Maybe I go, maybe I go to a 12 step group. Maybe we should fast. Maybe we should this, maybe we should that. Mm. Uh, Maybe I should never be at the house alone. I mean, we went through a marriage full of us trying just about everything. It really wasn't until the last two to three years that we decided because we even decided this before we really explored it, but we're like, maybe we shouldn't look at this as a shameful thing Mm -hmm. and just Mm -hmm. view it as like not a big deal because it it seemed like the shame around it was in some ways just as heavy as, or more so heavy than the dysphoria. And we weren't quite sure where the shame was coming from. And I know another thing for us too, we thought like, Oh, a good, in a good marriage, the husband and wife have sex. And so (laughs) it was like, whenever Beecher was really struggling, we kind of used sex as a Mm band-aid to like, oh, I'm fulfilling my wifely duty. Beecher Mm -hmm. is being 
you know, pleased in the right way. And if, if you were satisfying him well, there wouldn't be this demon in the closet, perhaps. Yeah, it was. Yeah, there's some kind of thing wrapped around that. I'm sure purity culture played a part of like, you know, in a healthy marriage, you have sex. And as long as we we're having sex, even if the sex was fine, you know, it was like, you know, we'll check in a box. And which I had, I had issues sexually just from purity culture on top of it. And then Beecher, it was. It was, I mean, I will say, and I've tried to entangle this some with therapy and with counseling, but, you know, I will say that having sex helped the dysphoria, so to speak. I don't know if it was because I felt more manly, you know, I mean, like, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily know, but I will say sex kind of helped that. And so there'd be this thing of like, oh, I'm really struggling. And April's like, sex? And I'm like, okay. Not well, even that I really wanted I it, think but too just... Because when you're, if when you're doing like society's like, oh, a man wants sex, mm -hmm. man wants sex. So if like it, I guess in our minds, we're like, oh, as long as we're, as long as Beecher works in this way, then they're normal. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. It, it, yeah. And, and I did work in that way. So yeah. it, yes, so, did it. So, so like, oh, okay, is, <laughs> Beecher but, does. But, I hope, I hope I'm not embarrassing you guys, but I, but I know you talk fairly, fairly yeah. openly about. No, we this haven't stuff, got, right? we haven't got to this part of our podcast yet. So this yeah. is a little. Oh, sneak peek. we are, we yeah. are to right. the engage, gauge period of the podcast, mm -hmm. but it's great. This is what's to come. Um, and I will say, we both spent our first many years of our marriage, both being very unfulfilled by our sex life. I thought it was because we weren't having sex enough. And then April, I think, took the mentality of this isn't fulfilling for either of us. So why do we have to do it so often? And mm -hmm. so there was this like, you know, this, this, it, we both agreed this isn't working very well. We're not being fulfilled. Well, honestly, part of me didn't even know that there was a problem because purity culture was like, oh, women don't care about sex, you know, just, just do it to get by. So yeah, yeah. No, I, I was like, oh, this is normal. But there was a lot of arguments and, and none yeah. of the, you know, it was. I mean, really, sex for the first many years of our marriage was a Band-Aid. It was a Band-Aid for both of our issues. Um, and and it wasn't wasn't good. Um, and so, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't even know what the I have, question was. But I have like a million sex questions I could ask. But <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I, I do want to... So, April, what is that like for you as a spouse to... Did it feel like there was something there was a deficit for you, for you or in you that your husband needed something that seemed outside the norm and i'm not talking about sex really i'm talking about more the expression of something inside what what did that mean to you in inside of your marriage and did you ever think like i'm out i'm not i'm not going to do this cuz this is not what i signed up for yeah i mean i would say early on beecher did a good job of hiding a lot of their struggle for me, not all of it, but some of it, like I, had, I, or maybe I was just living in denial and I was not thinking that it was as big of a deal as it was early on. Cause I, I kind of thought once we got married, that most of it went away. Um, but even then, even then though, I mean, I don't know. I just, I was very open and honest with April on days that I was struggling. I told her every single time I got into anything. But I would be really vague. I'd be like, well, I got into your closet again. And she'd go, it's okay. I forgive you. And then we'd move on. So like, I, I always told you. No, but, I, but and I'm not saying it, you didn't. I'm but just... it was this thing that neither she or I were excited to engage with because we, we couldn't classify it. So it was like, all right, I told her. She said she forgives me. All right, moving on. And then we didn't talk about it anymore. And then a week later, two weeks later. I'd well, I'm saying in. like early on, it was just more spread out. It wasn't, we didn't talk about it every single day. And then the last few years, since we really started dealing with it head on, it became a more regular conversation. And I've always, like, I love Beecher and I've always was like crazy about them. Um, but there were definitely moments. And I, I think the thing that I had to realize was, yes, it bothered me, especially initially when I would see Beecher in like more feminine clothes or in makeup, but I wanted to get to the root of why it was bothering me. Like, is this the Holy spirit, you know, telling me this is wrong, which early on I would have said that's what it was. But then as it went on and like, as I like started reading scripture about it and just kind of deconstructing the idea of gender roles and like 
close and like what that even means. Um, I came to the realization that the reason why it bothered me wasn't necessarily because it bothered me, but it, it bothered the conservative upbringing that I had, but that no matter how much I deconstruct is still ingrained in me. And a lot of it had to deal with like, Oh my gosh, what are other people going to say? What are other people mm -hmm. going to think about this? If this gets out and I've been taught, I should not find this attractive. And so it took a long time before I even allowed myself to figure out to like admit that, no, I, I can be attracted to this because I was like fighting my insides for a long time. And like, no, I can't, no, this, there's something, this isn't normal, you know, quote unquote, mm. that makes sense. <laughs>Great conversation, is it? Let me interrupt for just a second and ask a quick question. Are you worried about the cultural divide in our country? Do you feel discouraged by that division in the church and in the nation's culture? Do you find yourself struggling with your personal place and identity in it? Well, let me tell you, you are not alone. Many Christians and many former Christians are trying to figure out where they are or if they're headed off the cliff. And that's why I came around and designed Reconstruction U. Reconstruction U provides opportunity to challenge and identify the sources of your own mindset, to have your mind renewed in the season, to secure an identity that allows transformation of your narratives that will help you be a source of light and change for yourself and for others to accept the right of yourself to have safety and value and purpose in this life because you are good and you deserve good things to happen around you. I want to help you design a well-being in your life with the help of whatever spirituality looks like for you that will allow you to love yourself in a way that gives you room to love your neighbor and to live a life that is powerful, fulfilling, and sustainable. And right now, if you go to my website, pastor-paul.com, you can sign up for a free personal consultation with me. And everybody who does so is going to get a very special rate. We've never offered this low a price for Reconstruction You So go to pastor-paul.com, sign up for some free hangout time with me, and I'll tell you about this amazing offer as we want to make Reconstruction You available to everyone in these tight financial times. Pastor-Paul.com is the address to go to find out more information and to set up your free hangout time with me. I look forward to seeing you. Now, back to our podcast with Beecher and April. And I just want to take a moment here and say, I really appreciate you guys sharing this story. And if I ask anything that's out of line, you guys can tell me, I don't want this to feel heavy at all for you, but I, I think it's so courageous and important what you're doing, because I believe there are a lot of other people that have similar stories that maybe don't know they're allowed to even delve into exploring the story and what's happening. They have the shameful behavior going on in the household and they're still trying to pray it away and all these things. So I just, I, I do want to take a moment here and just say thank you guys for being willing to share this story because I, I think there are a lot of people who probably need to hear it. So I really appreciate that. How did, uh, how does it feel for you Beecher at this point to now start to express this a little more and as you've done recently, do it very public what has that process been like for you? I mean, it's been, overall, it's been really wonderful. Um, you know, I mean, this was my kryptonite, right? I mean, this was middle school Beecher, you know, gets a compliment on being on the basketball team or the baseball team or say, oh my gosh, Beecher, you're just the best. And then I'm like, yeah, but you don't know what I really want to be wearing. You don't want to, you don't really want to know what I'm thinking. If you knew that you wouldn't be saying it. So every single compliment that I got for two decades was like, a, yeah, you think I'm Superman you think I'm invincible, but I have this kryptonite and you know, it was a weakness and in a weird way, just finally coming out is just me saying, hey, you know that thing that I always thought was a weakness? Actually, it's just 
part of me and it's not a weakness. And so I will say in a weird way, my self-confidence has gone way up, like way up because I just, I don't have this thing that I'm hiding. I don't have this insecurity that I'm always guarding. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's been really nice. I mean, literally um, I was guest lecturing at a university a couple of weeks ago and um, I, I'm a, I'm a film professor, but anyways, I was, I was guest lecturing at university and they asked like, well, how did you get into writing? Cause I, I write screenplays and direct. And it was so amazing just to be like, Oh, actually uh, my first screenplay I wrote in seventh grade, it was called when cheerleaders attack. And it was about, female cheerleaders who bite all of the middle school students and turn them all into female cheerleaders. <laughs> and I'm like, I started writing and creating because I didn't have an outlet for my gender dysphoria. Like I got, I have so many scripts that I wrote in middle school and high school and, um, and, and college. And, you know, it's, it's this thing of like, I can be honest about it now. And that's wonderful because about, you know, what, five years ago, I started realizing why I was writing everything I did. I was starting to realize why I was a filmmaker and people would be like, why are you a filmmaker? And I'd be like, well, you know, I like movies, <laughs> you know, and like, and like, cause I've got this kryptonite that, I'm, that I, or this, this, this weakness that I'm just like, oh yeah, I've got to keep it close, so close to the best. And now it's just like, hey, you know, I can be honest. Like, like there's nothing else that, that I've, that this, there's nothing else that I'm hiding, so to speak. It's, it's. And the world's in an end. Yeah, the world didn't end. And in fact, presenting non, I will say this, one of the other most amazing things is as a, as a middle school or high school, I mean, all throughout the past two decades, you think, oh my gosh, if I go present more feminine or present as a woman, I'm going to get made fun of. People are going to throw stuff at me. Like you just get all the worst thoughts. Every time I've presented more feminine, people are like, oh my gosh, I love that nail polish. Oh my gosh, I love that hoodie. And like, I get so many compliments, most mainly from women, but so many compliments just all over the place. I was, I was flying in an airport and I got compliments on my hair. People were like stopping like, oh my gosh, I love your hair. And I'm like, this never happened when I was male presenting. Like I never got stopped. I never got this like special treatment. I went to Starbucks the other day and the barista was just super sweet. And then just started like loading up a whole bag of food, like a ton of Starbucks food. She's like, I was going to throw this out, but I just want you to have it because I just think you're amazing. And I'm like, well, it's also this you finally awesome. have a style because for so long, too, like when Beecher and I first met, Beecher had no style. Like Beecher wore oversized shirts and super like cargo shorts. Mm -hmm. Like and, and we've realized now like Beecher was trying to fit like Beecher wanted to blend in as much as possible. The only question mm -hmm. until really these past three years, the only question I ever asked myself about clothing was how well will how well will I blend in wearing that? And mm. That was it. That was the only dick thing that was dictated. And by, by blend in, do you mean look look normal? Is that what you're look masculine enough, but just just don't yeah, don't stand out. Just play the part of boy or man. And I remember too, at one point I uh when we were when we were dating or engaged, it was early on, and we went shopping and I saw this pink shirt and I thought it was super cool looking. It was a it was a guy's pink shirt, but it was pink, and I showed it to Beecher and he, Beecher's like, mm -mm, mm -mm. nope. Like Beecher would not even wear anything that had a hint of femininity because they didn't want to be found out. And also, and also it was triggering for me. Even, even April asked me like this pink shirt was triggering. And I only wore things, I would say only 90% 90, 90 plus of the clothing I had were given, was given to me because then if anyone ever complimented it or pointed it out, I said, oh, my mom gave me that. Oh, my grandmother gave me that. Oh, my cousin donated this to me. Oh, like, I could never say like, I like this because mm. if I ever asked myself what I actually liked, I was triggered and spiraled and it was, it was, it was awful. So um, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm an eighties kid. And so pastel colors were in and, and uh, if we ever wore a pink shirt, we would say it's, it's salmon. It's not pink. It's salmon. <laughs> so, you, know, you gotta, you gotta hold on to that, uh, that masculinity, of course. In oh, there. I know. Talk about the, the Christian side of this for you guys. Did you, did you work out your theology or did you just say, we don't care about the theology. We're going to live the way we feel is right to live. And we'll work through the theology as we go. Or was it some variation of that? Um, I feel like, especially when we were first dealing with it, theology was 
almost like the most important thing. Like we wanted to be in God's will and doing the right thing. And, but we were, we were still very evangelical and we were surrounded by, you know, conservative Christian evangelical communities at church or whatever that were reinforcing the patriarchal gender roles, um, even if it was subtle. And so we had that kind of going along with us. So like for me, especially early on, I was like, is this wrong? Like, even if I don't find it wrong, like, is this wrong? Like, is this going to send you to hell? And, yeah. um, you know, like, cause early, I mean, early on, I, I have literally laid hands on Beecher and tried to rebuke the demon out of him. Um, I was raised Pentecostal. So Beecher asked me did to it, do that. Did it work Beecher? <laughs> well, clearly the, 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 yeah, <laughs> we rebuked the demon of evangelicalism yeah okay all crazy. right it's how i've had people pray to try to exercise the femininity out of me a few times and there's this really awkward moment right afterwards where they're like did it work <laughs> and i'm like i don't always feel this work so i'm gonna say maybe and then it would always be followed by no you just have to believe that it worked like you just have to have faith that it worked and let's go celebrate and i'll be like yeah, but I really think it's going to come back. Like I just, and then it always <laughs> came back every single time. So it's this really awkward thing of, 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 but yeah, I definitely asked April to pray in tongues. And, and I, for me, I will say, I mean, I really, really went to the Bible when I was struggling and put up so many verses around my room when I was having panic attacks. And, and I will say the Bible is very, very thin on this, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like I tried to find scripture that could reinforce my manhood, so to speak, and, and tell me that there's firm lines. And I, I mean, it, there's just not much. I mean, I guess you go to Deuteronomy. Men will not wear women's clothes. Women will not wear men's clothes. But I mean, that's Deuteronomy. I mean, I'm not, I'm not. That, well, I'm not the, taking anything else from the that thing book. that always hung us up too. when I was like, well, you just shouldn't wear women's clothes, even though I had no reason. And the beach would be like, you're literally wearing men's sweatpants right now. <laughs> like I, and because I grew up, I was a bit of a, like at the time they would have called me a tomboy. So I've always yeah. been a little more like, I don't look masculine, but I have like, I like things that society would call masculine. Like I remember early on in our marriage too, I hated cooking and like doing like the domestic things and Beecher liked it, but we like fought each other on it because Beecher felt like that's something that I should do. And I felt like it was something that I should do too. So we were miserable with me cooking like mediocre meals when Beecher is actually really good at cooking, but we we're like, no, you can't do it. I have to do it because I've got the vagina. So yeah. I mean, yeah, it's. And, and, so I think as we're talking about shades of things and variations, uh, you know, even I think in the, in Christianity, we would say, and you're either straight and wear men's clothing or you're gay and don't. So is there a difference between presenting with more feminine characteristics as you're talking about and, and being gay? I guess we kind of need to make that distinction as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, so I still, I mean, it's confusing as non-binary, but I guess I still identify as heterosexual. I'm still attracted to women. Um, but I will say, obviously, I mean, in sixth grade, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm wanting to be my sixth grade teacher. I mean, I'm sitting in the back row like, oh, she's beautiful. I want to grow up to be like her. So, of course, I ask myself a lot, like, am I gay? Because that was the only word I knew. Like, am I, am I gay? And I never found any boys or men attractive at any point in my life. And so I was like, I don't think I'm gay. Like, I still find women attractive in a more emotional, like, handhold hug way, not really like in a visually stimulated way, but that's a separate conversation. Um, and so, yeah, for me, uh, I was never, I mean, sexuality was just a different thing. It, it still is a different, is a different thing. thing. Yeah. I mean, it still, is, yeah, it still is a different thing. And, and you know, it's something obviously that, that we've discussed and that, you know, I mean, at this at this point, it really hasn't shifted too much. All of my struggle really was in gender, but um, I had a lot of insecurities about my sexuality because I, I didn't know who I was and didn't know, you know, I saved everything for marriage. So I was like, um, I'm going to get to be with my wife on my wedding night and it's not, I'm not going to work normally is what was a big fear of mine. And so, um, 
-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to go that I'm not basically, it was just a very, very, very big insecurity. And I think one reason I going back to kind of the first thing, one thing, one reason that my OCD, which I do struggle with a, a little bit, um, was so honed in on April's past boyfriends because I was like, she's been with real men and then she's going to get with me and she's going to mm -hmm. know that, that there's something different about me that I, that, and then, you know, um, that was just overwhelming. So then of course I was feeling so much shame and insecurity, but I'm aiming it at April. Right. Cause I'm like, well, then you're the one that was with those men and you know, or that one man. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, but sexuality, I was super, super sexually insecure. Um, but it was because of my gender. Cause that's really what I've wrestled with. It's it's so interesting how this. I, I mean, I I did a, a TikTok live not long ago where I, I and and to freak people out, I put on dangly earrings, and mm -hmm. and you should have seen the comments. And I and when I do a TikTok live, I may get four hundred views, and on this one, I got thirteen hundred views. Wow. Um, and 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 the Christians are saying God would not approve of you wearing those earrings, and and I'm like. I think King David probably wore dangly earrings. I, I think Moses probably did. I, you know, maybe like, who determined what was male and female? Who determined what God approved of and didn't prove of in clothing? I, I think we're getting really silly about this because even high-heeled shoes were developed for men, not for women. They originally men's mm -hmm. uh, or, or men's attire. So I, I just think we're pretty silly in this idea that somehow God has chosen the clothing we're supposed to use, to, to wear based upon gender norms. And I, I just think we got to just start to break down all this silly stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 100 percent. I will say something that's been really interesting as I've come out to, you know, and I mean, before I came out publicly on Instagram and TikTok and all the social media, I mean, I came out to roughly 100 people. And it's fascinating. Um, I came out to a lot of women and they responded with questions. And I mean, some, and a couple of occasions fear and those questions were out of fear, but it was, it was very much still me focused as I came out to men. So interestingly, I've had one man tell me that he has always really liked women's tennis shoes and that he's never told anyone. And that I'm the only, so I'm now the only person in the world that knows this person really likes women's tennis shoes. And then I had someone else come out and say, you know, I've always loved skirts. Like I've always loved skirts. I would love to wear a skirt. And now and I'm like, how, like, and, they, and they're, they're telling me in this way that it's this big secret they're getting off their chest. And I'm just like, man, these gender norms are not working for anybody. Like they, they, even these men that are very much like, I'm not non-binary. I've never had gender dysphoria. They still carry around this, these things that when they actually, when I actually, where I'm at now, I hear it and I'm like, okay, women's tennis shoes, you like the colors that are on women's tennis shoes. Like that is not something that should keep you up at night. That should not be something that you have to keep so hidden. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's interesting. I do feel like women, and I think, I mean, April and I talked about it. Women um, have more room to explore um with their gender expression they can as a professor at, at a christian school i saw girls come to my class wearing you know men's jeans and t-shirts and nobody cares um but yeah the other way around men cannot express um really the other the other way and i will say too the way the way i kind of view it i had a good conversation with with uh actually one of our mutual friends um he called me and was just talking about like liking uh feminine things but not really seeing it wanting to identify as non-binary and i was like look whether you identify as non-binary or trans or whatever i am 100 percent behind anyone that's willing to break uh gender norms and that can push this conversation like if you if you are still a cis male but you like skirts great wear the skirt like i am i am there for you and i'm going to be standing with you 100 percent. if you're non-binary they them great if you're a trans woman trans man like anyone that's saying that gets on the, the side of these gender norms are ridiculous. Let, let's, let's start to push it. I'm going to be there mm -hmm. for celebrating. So it's not like I only, I, I, as a non-binary person, I'm like, Oh my gosh, look at that cis male, like trouncing on non-binary territory. I'm like, no, like, please, like let's trounce all over that line so that the line just isn't there and we can all just be ourselves and no one cares. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I recently was reading a book on this and I never realized this, that, 
even the the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors, the the word used for that coat is the same word that was used for a daughter, I think of King David's named Tamar, not not Tamar that had sex with Judah, her father-in-law, but the other uh, another Tamar. And it and it was the same word, the only two times it was used in the Bible. And for her, it's translated as she wore a robe with long sleeves as the virgin daughters of the kings would wear. And the the person who was writing this, this uh, book that I was reading was saying, Joseph's brothers didn't hate him because he was egotistical. They hated him because he was wearing women's clothing mm. and, and worked in the kitchen with his, you know, and, and his dad loved him. Um, and I find that fascinating. As, and as I started thinking about that, I thought, you know, God chose Jacob, the, the, the little kitchen worker kid over his hulky brother, hulky, hairy brother Esau. And, and God chose Abel, the gardener over Cain, the, the hunter. Uh, and even Jesus was, you know, meek and a lamb, even though he was a tough, you know, tough guy. We know that. But even he was sort of the more pacifistic character. And all through the Bible, we see God choosing the maybe less normal, manly man. The He didn't choose the wild at heart book reader. He chose yeah. the other <laughs> ones. And so I, I just, as I've thought about this, I thought, how did we miss this? That, that maybe God sometimes prizes things in, in maleness that are different than, uh, than our culture does. Absolutely. I mean, I think if, oh, I just think if someone could sit down and read the Bible without the cultural context of today, and then they got done reading it, and then they walked into the evangelical Bible belt, and they saw, you know, the masculine man with the gun and American flag, and that's like, you know, that's the, they're like, wait a minute, did we, read, did, we, did we read the same Bible? Like, David had a slingshot. David David didn't kill Saul when he had the opportunity. Like, and you're out there with the gun and, you know, yeah. American flag and a huge loud truck. And I'm just like, I don't, I, I, I've really, honestly, in moments, and I know, I know y'all have had the same experience because I listen to Evangelicalish every week and I'm good friends with, with you, Paul, and obviously partners with April, but like, it feels like evangelical culture has read a different Bible. Like it doesn't. So, tell us where the the name of the podcast again. Where can people find it and find you guys? Yes, it is called the Non Binary Marriage Podcast, and it's I think it's pretty much on every podcast platform out there. Um, if you want to follow us individually, I we know we're both on TikTok and Instagram. I am at April A Joy. April Joy one. And I am at Hello Beecher, B E E C H E R. And so, yeah, you know, reach out. I will say one of the best things about doing this, actually, the best thing about doing this podcast is how many people have reached out saying, oh my gosh, us too. Us too. Yeah. Our marriage too. Over here. Yes. I mean, like, it's, it's been, uh, like, I know as I've, as I've, come to discover myself and, and then in trans therapy groups, I know there's other people like me and I've met them, mm -hmm. but still I've not met that many. So to keep, to get dozens of these messages, emails, I go, okay. Yeah. There's a lot of us out there or marriages that are deconstructing gender roles and wrestling with what we wrestled with. So I encourage anyone to check out the podcast and shoot us a message. Um, we're also um, at uh, the non or non-binary marriage at gmail.com so that's it for our public portion of the podcast with beecher and april renning but i always like to give bonus time to those of you in the pastor paul support community if you go to my website pastor-paul.com click on that support pastor paul button and sign up at at least 5.99 a month anywhere up to a hundred dollars a month you'll get access to our bonus podcast with beecher and april where i'm going to ask some really intimate questions about what does sex look like in a sex look like in a non-binary marriage why would a man want to wear effeminate clothing and how do they just navigate the difficulty of these things including learning new pronouns in the middle of it all so if that's of interest to you go to pastor-paul.com if you're not already a member of our support community 
click on that support pastor Paul button and for anywhere from $5 and 99 cents a month to a hundred dollars a month, you can be a part of the support community and get our bonus podcast with April and Beecher. I love to provide extra space for those in the community. And I look forward to seeing you there on the post evangelical bonus time podcast with Beecher and April Rennie.